Merry Christmas to you all and welcome to a very festive GG weekend watch this week, kindly sponsored by SBK as usual. And we have Santa's little tipping help us to guide us through this weekend's uh, action. Well, I say this weekend, Sunday and Monday's action is what we're going to be covering. So we have our helpful little elves here in Daryl Carter and Andrew Mount, the return of Daryl Carter as well. We're all feeling very festive, hugely looking forward to the Boxing Day and the action of the 27th of December as well. Now, this is going to be a bit of a different GG weekend watch this weekend because, of course, we don't actually have declarations. So this is basically going to be sort of giving you a bit of a feel of the racing that we have to look forward to, the runners that we're likely to be seeing and sort of tips at this stage. But of course, any actual selections you'll be finding on the website from the lads there at gg.co.uk. But we're still going to have a lot of fun looking through what we have to look forward to. And we have a few Christmas crackers certainly to look forward to on Boxing Day. So we shall begin with the feature race on Boxing Day. This is the King George the Sixth Chase, which is a grade one over three miles and is the most prestigious chase away from the Gold Cup. Fascinating lineup this year, filled with previous winners in Frodon, who won last year's renewal, as well as 2019 and 2018 winner Clanders Obo. So Paul Nichols has a strong hand for sure, but the Irish Raiders are sure to pose a huge threat because we have the small matter of the Gold Cup winner here in Manila Indo. So I can't wait for this. Andrew, could you please kickstart us with the King George? So the what race? I don't think I've looked at this one. Um, <laughs> it was no, an afterthought. It was an afterthought of a race. Don't worry. This is a belter, but um, I'm, I'm so used to looking at races for this video when we've got the final decks. I, I keep mm. looking at this, thinking, "My God, we've got a big feel for once. It's going to be fantastic." So, uh, ten at the moment. Potentially, we might lose one or two of those, maybe more. But uh, looks an absolute belter, as you say. And interesting to see Clandes Obo going straight here rather than mm. having that prep run beforehand because. He's got a phenomenal record second time out. I know it didn't work out in this race last year after we had probably a harder race than they you know, normally uh, expect uh, when he was beaten in the um, uh, at Haydock in the Betfair chase. Um, so I I'm not 100% sure about why they've you know come here um, you know, first, first time out. Although you could say, well, if you just look at his last two runs since they put the cheek pieces on, he's a different horse, blah, blah, mm -hmm. blah. Um, but at the, the likely prices, I, I can leave him alone, let him go and back. The, the constant worry with Clandes Obo, even though he has won this race twice before, of course, is that he does tend to come from off the pace. Or, and when he was beaten here, he was perhaps a little bit too far out of his ground. We've seen it time and time again. Uh, the King George, Kempton over fences in particular, is a front runner's track. And, you know, look at what Frodon did last year, despite jumping out to the, le uh, to the left of most of the fences. And again, if Clandes Obo is a little bit too far back, that could be the same sort of situation. So I can see him running well without winning. And for first time out, I'm happy to let him go in a shortage price, despite the fact that I love the horse. I've actually gone with a big price one, Mr. Fisher, um, for Ooh. Nicky Anderson. Um now, bear in mind, um, Froden's about five to one for this race. Mr. Fisher's forties, uh, and of course they clashed um, at Sandown, didn't they, um, at the end of last season with um, Froden winning by a neck. And um, Mr. Fisher's just got a great record in smallish fields. He, he, he tends to struggle in tr with traffic, and uh, when he's had sort of a field of sort of ten or eleven runners or fewer. You know, he, he generally runs his race, runs extremely well, you know, and uh, I just thought, given his, um, you know, effectiveness right-handed, he's a course winner. That's something that's often underplayed at Kempton, but we've seen it time and time again. Big price horses who have form at Kempton often turn up in the King George, despite looking a little bit outclassed and run well. Um, in 2017, I put two up in my column on Gigi. Uh, Long-suffering readers might remember double shuffle at 100 to one and T for two mm. at 33s. They finished second and third. Double shuffle's got been a length, I think, at an SP of 50s, and it was the course form angle there, and um, that's the, the angle here with Mr. Fisher. He, he's won here at Kempton before. You know, he's run well at Huntingdon, flat right-handed, like Kempton, and uh, although his stamina for three miles is unproven. You know, you look at his um, that um, Sandown run, a neck second to Frodon over two miles, six and a half furlongs on good ground. You know, before that, he was still going well behind Clandes Obo over three, one and eight three. So he, he, he's still pretty young. He's only a seven year old. It's a funny when you look at him, you think he can't be seven. He must be nine or ten because he's been yeah. around forever. Um, but he, he goes well fresh. It's first time out. He, he likes the track. 
and um, he likes smallish fields. It could, could have been even more. And I think when you look at his sort of completed record in sort of, uh, you know, fields of 10 or less, something like, you know, six wins and a couple of seconds um, from eight completed starts. So uh, I thought Mr. Fisher, 40 to one, was the each way value in the race. Nicely done. Yeah, Mr. Fisher say a few question marks over the trip. But when you look at that intertwining form line with Frodo, he does look a very big price there, around 40 to one. So outsider then for Andrew, Darrell, yourself, please, for the King George. Yeah, I was going to give a good mention to, to Mr. Fisher as well, actually. Um, I was going to just touch yes. on the point as well. In the entry bowl, he was uh, he was 15 to 2 and Clanders over was 5 to 2. Uh, and for some reason now he's a 40 to 1 shot. Maybe it's because it's first time up. I'm not mm -hmm. sure. I think he's got local claims. But I actually fancy the other Henderson horse, Chantry House, quite strongly as an each way bet around 5 to 1. 2 for 2, right handed. 3 for 3, if you want to include that point. Uh, returned at Sandown with a lovely prep run, I thought. I know he didn't have to beat much, but he. He showed he was alive and kicking. He did a, a fair enough time on his own. Um, jumped well throughout. I just thought it was a lovely springboard in, in, into this race. Mm -hmm. uh, look, this is probably his toughest test to date, no doubt about it. But this horse has always been a free miler. He was always going to be seen to best effect when he gets up in trip. The fact that he finished third in the Supreme Novice Hurdle uh, and above average Supreme, Supreme Novice Hurdle as well. Um, Suggests he's, he's quite a useful tool. He's, he's had Astier and Falange behind twice in the Supreme and in the Marsh. Mm -hmm. uh, he's he's going to love the ground. I, don't, I, don't think, I mean, we're due a little bit of rain, but I'm hoping it's going to be good soft. It can, it tends to dry up quite quickly. Uh, he's got two blips on his CV. I mean, blips, if you want to call the third in the Supreme, a blip. Uh, and last December at Cheltenham, when he, he was tailed off behind the Fusil Raffles on soft ground. Now, they, they said it was soft ground. That was the issue that day. Not really buying that, given that Foots or Raffles normally wants good ground, you know. Mm. I, I don't know. He just wasn't right that day for whatever reason. But you can put a line through one run. You don't want to be doing it too often with, with horses at this level. But one run is fine. He's not blocked his copybook book since then. He picked up the piece in the marsh. Uh, I think he's a nice horse. I think he's got very few questions to answer. I think everything's gone well up to this point. I think if you look at some of his rivals, I totally agree with Andrew. But at the point um, about Clan Desivo coming here after a break. Now, he's not going to come here undercooked by Paul Nichols, that's for sure. But, mm -hmm. you know, history does tell you that he intends to improve for a run. Now, I think last year they were looking at uh, Haydock and, and they went to Haydock in a better fair chase on heavy ground. And they thought that that was the reason that ruined his his King George hope. So they've come here directly fresh. I know he's been good the last twice. He was very good at Aintree. But I think at Punchestown, I think he picked up the end of season pieces a little bit. I still... Um, Back in second album photo, had run a hard race in the Gold Cup, and considering he was sparingly race that season, I thought that was probably a little bit too much of an ask for album photo to go and win that Punchestown race. He was beaten the year before as well by Kenboy, and back in third at Punchestown was Fakir Dalberis. Now he's a suspect stay over three miles. He had been to Cheltenham and Aintree, and then was asking to to put in a big performance at Punchestown. So I, I thought he was at the right place at the right time at Punchestown. Um, he obviously likes his course, but again, like Andrew said, uh, coming off the pace is, is not going to be ideal here, I don't think. And that would be my worry for backers of a Tornado Flyer, who's going to be held right up at the rear of the field to try and get this trip for the first time. I don't think he's bred really for three miles, but he does catch it, catch the eye, staying on at the end of his races, and he can fool you into a, a false sense of, you know, he's going to get this trip, he's going to get this trip, but it just might not be the case. He's willing to pick up the piece in a lot of these races and claim prize money. Uh, Manila Indo, I'd slightly worry about going right-handed. Um, this horse has got a fantastic chance in the Gold Cup going forward, despite what happens here. But he's one for five right-handed. And that would just worry me with him. I don't know if a tight track like Kempton is definitely going to suit him. Uh, when, you, when you're racing around Kempton, you, if you turn into the home straight, you don't have too much time to organise yourself before that first fence in the home straight. Mm. And that could just catch a few horses out. Mr Fisher, I do like him, but his jumping worries me a little bit for this course. That would be the only slight concern with him. He, um, he's been on big galloping tracks over fences so a tight track like Kempton I know he's got a good record over hurdles here but over fences I don't know if his jumping's quite good enough I thought Frodon was pretty solid but I think pace pressure gets him beat Dashel Drasher should be good enough for me um, I just can't see Chantry House out the three I think if you're backing mm -hmm. him fast to one each way out the three into nothing I think he's a fair enough bet here he's got to improve um, if you like him for this have a couple of quid on the Gold Cup because if he wins this he's going to shorten but uh, yeah Chantry for me Fantastic. Proper comprehensive review then. We're happy to have Daryl back, certainly so, to give us a proper in-depth look then at the King George. So brilliant from the two lads there. And just for sort of my penny's worth, really, for this race, I have I have written up a guide for each of these runners. So I'm just going to go through 
sort of my take on each horse just with one line because well I'm here and I'm in a Christmas jumper so I may as well give an opinion <laughs> why not so to start with yeah and plus it was a toss of a coin whether Daryl turned up or not today anyway so, <laughs> you, you, had have, you had to have somebody prepared to stand in didn't you <laughs> yeah did you <laughs> Yeah, no, and aren't we delighted, though, that he did? Aren't we over the moon they did? Even if he forgot his uh, the Christmas jumper memo, Andrew, unlike the pair of us do, which I feel we've got matching his and hers at the minute. It's fantastic. <laughs> but at least Aaron's giving us a good. So I'm just going to run through quickly race pod order as they currently stand. Uh, Assyrian for launch. I think Kempton will actually suit him because when you look at his unseat at Punch Sound, we know that he jumps right-handed. However, only two fences at Punch Sound with the chase track being on the outer, on the outer track have a running rail on the landing side of two of the fences, the final fence and the first pass the post. So he actually only, he didn't even get to the final fence. And as we know by that point, but he had jumped those pretty straight uh, up until his jumping started to go away. Rather than at Kempton, you have the running rail uh, the whole way around the track because the chase track is on the inside. That should really help him, I do think, but we still don't know exactly what to expect from him. Chantry House, I totally agree with Darrow. I think that we still don't know how good he is because of his conservative campaigning. And for that reason, I think that there should be far more to come from him yet. And as you say, definitely bred for this trip. So I think Chantry House is solid. Clanders Obo, the record in this last century of horses making a seasonal debut is fourth, unseated, pulled up sixth, pulled up second, pulled up second, pulled up seventh. So Clanders Obo is going to have to buck a significant trend to be winning this. Dashiell Drasher, this is away from Ascot and unlikely to have soft conditions, but he should put the pace pressure on Frodon. Frodon's been known to solve for not getting his own way out in front, so that's going to be a concern to him. But apart from that, he does look pretty solid. Loss in translation, I feel he might suffer from the Imperial Commander syndrome, so I'm going to dub it now, of just not a horse not taking to Kempton. We know Imperial Commander twice disappointed him at King George before winning the Ryanair and the Gold Cup, so don't rule him out of a Gold Cup tilt if he does disappoint here. I just don't think the track plays to his strengths. Manella Rindo was the one most likely winner for me with the form, should massively come on from that reappearance start at Down Royal, where everyone said he was basically fat. So he should come on from that. Mr. Fisher, again, I worry about the trip for him as well as his jumping if he puts pace pressure on. St. Calvados, again, is coming here off of a lengthy absence. And we know how keen he was in this race last year, which just paid to his weakening finish. And then Tornado Fly, I thought was solid, apart from I prefer more rain for him. But this trip definitely looks a good ploy for him because, as you say, Daryl, the way he was staying on in the John Durkin last time out did notably catch the eye. So they, that's my sort of run through. But Manella Rindo was certainly the horse to beat for me in the race. So that is the feature race we've covered very comprehensively then. So we will swiftly move on to, well, I say move on. We're going to go back to the 120 at Kempton. This is a novices limited handicap chase, a 0 to 140 contest for four year olds and over, over two miles four and a half furlongs. We have a whole host of likeable types in here entered who come here in very good form. None other than the top weight, Manella Trump, who runs off top mark at 140 and is bidding for an eight timer. So Daryl, can Manella Trump continue this winning sequence? Um, I don't think he's going to run. I think he ran today. Didn't he? Mm. Yeah, I think he ran today. Um, yeah, disappointed got... at Ludlow, didn't he? Or, or, mm. or finished second yeah. in what was effectively a match. Yeah. Yeah, it was a bit... I, I... To be honest with you, I thought it was a big ask for him anyway, really. But um, I, I like two in this. I obviously don't know who's going to turn up yet, but uh, my eye is very much drawn to Danny Kerwin and, and Mr. Coffee. Uh, Danny Kerwin, I thought, ran a remarkable race at, at Cheltenham on his chase debut. Uh, it, I just wondered why they kept him over hurdles for so long before going mm -hmm. over fences, because he's a he's a point-to-point -point winner over three miles. He's been kept over sort of like two, two miles three, two miles four for a long time. I thought he was a boat back in the day. Uh, I really <laughs> thought he was slow as a, an old boat. But uh, I thought that run at Cheltenham behind Annual and Victors was remarkable. He jumped out to the right. He took a few long, got into really tight a few. Just looked like he just didn't have a clue what he was really doing. Um, I think he's going to come on a ton for that. Uh, mm -hmm. Annual and Victors is, is subsequently rated now 143. is one next time out. Uh, Torn and Fraid was back in third. That horse ran really nice race behind my Drogo. Uh, Favour obviously came out of one and beat, uh, beat was it Tall and Frey next time, I think, yeah, by half a length. Um, I think the form is pretty strong. The time figure was good. Uh, coming back right-handed is, is a huge positive for him. Uh, one thing I'll just keep an eye on eye out uh, for um, in final declarations is if they put a tongue tie on him because he was lolling with his tongue out all the way down the home straight. Mm. And I just wonder if he's had a wind surgery, if they stick that tongue tie on, 
That'd be interesting. He handles the track fine, but he, he's got to go right-handed. He's better than this mark of 133 over fences. That's that's almost a given. Uh, so he, he'll be very, very interesting second time after a wind-up. Uh, Mr. Coffey, I thought he was a bit... I thought he docked it a little bit in Newbury. <laughs> I thought he uh, I thought he didn't really go through with it. But when I watched it back a few times, I just think he tired. I just mm. think he... Um, Nicky Henderson was saying that his horse hasn't been out in the grass, etc. like that. The money came for him that day, but he looked like he needed the run. And he looked an absolute natural over fences for much of the race. Now, he, again, has got a bit of a mind of his own. Took took a few long, got in, a, in tight to a couple. But I thought it was a, a really good performance. The, the winner not available has gone out and won again today off a £3 high mark. Uh, Ludlow beat my bloody selection. Um, <laughs> but, but I just thought he would improve a good deal for that. It was his first start mm-hmm. of defences. Uh, and he goes up in trip today. I, I'm, I'm glad they're going up in trip with him because I think two miles is done for him. I don't think he's quick enough for it. Mm-hmm. Um, I think he's been keen a lot a lot over two miles where they go a, a scorching gallop and uh, it just sort of likes him up and he just wants to go, go, go. I think going over two and a half is going to help him. He's completely unexposed. I love the pair of them. I think they're... Um, I think they've got big, big futures, whereas I don't think a lot of these in this field have. I think they're either handicapped mm-hmm. to where they should be or they sort of lack the scope to improve. So I'm going to take a look at those two when the decks come out. Yeah, so see if they're still in there. So that's Mr. Coffee and Danny Kerwin, wasn't it? Uh, yes. for, for your two then. Yeah, so see how decks come out then. Andrew, yourself, please, for this race. Yeah, I quite like Giacomo. He won on, uh, won on Boxing Day last year at Wing Canton, a sharp right-handed track. You, you look at his wins, he's only ever won at, uh, on sharp tracks, Wing Canton twice, Newton Abbott and uh, to Aintree. Now, uh, he was only chinned uh, by a head at Wing Canton last time out. Kempton should suit. He's yet to race here over turf. That's on the turf. He, he ran in an all-weather bumper once. Um, but if there's a good pace on and a um, you know, big field, strongish gallop, which I hope there will be, then I, I thought Giacomo's got a great chance of uh, creeping into it from off the pace. Sebastopol, who is uh, luckless, keeps finding one too good and then looked like he was going to finally go one better over two miles two here last time out when he fell. Uh, we talked about him in previous um, weekend watches as a potential for the grand annual because he all improved for a big field and strong pace. So again, stepping up to two and a half miles, if it looks like there's plenty of pace on, um, Sebastopol might run a race. And uh, But yeah, I'm going to go for uh, Giacomo uh, or Giacomo each way. <laughs> the pronunciations of Andrew Mount get better and better. Every week. He's obviously got whatever Christmas present he wants on his brain now. We know that he wants uh, clearly something from Giacomo. Um, yes, hopefully that jumper wasn't from it there. <laughs> Anyway, Mr. Mount, but yes, Jackamar then in the 120 for Andrew. But again, just wait till you see what um, decks come out. So we will move on to the next race at Kempton. This is the 155. We're back in the grade one game with the Corso Star Novices Chase over the same course and distance as the King George just two races later on. And for all, we only have the six the six runners in this race. We do at least have two the two horses we really wanted lining up here in Brave Man's Game and Ahoy Senior. But Andrew, do you side with one of these two talents or does something else in here take your fancy? No, I think we can get both of these beats. Um, Ooh, the interesting. Gra- interesting. I mean, the- what are you smoking? Yeah, I mean, the, gra- <laughs> the, gra- the, ground's, the ground's you know good at the moment. There's not a lot of rain forecast at uh, Kempton over Christmas, plenty at uh, Chepso for the Welsh mm-hmm. National. And I mean, bear in mind, let's talk about Brave Man's Game. He's the odds on favourite. And um, does he stay three miles? Um, the last time he tried, he got beat comprehensively by a 66 to one shot, uh, a a, a senior. Now, so where's he going to get the extra stamina from? All the times they've pulled him out on good ground, if if they don't get any rain, which is possible, then, um, you know, why is he going to suddenly um, enjoy ground that they've not run him on previously? Mm. So, yeah, I I think he's potentially vulnerable. Uh, obviously, yeah, we don't know the final makeup of the race. That's that's one thing we're dealing with here. You know, he, he might end up running against you know two twenty-five to one shots. Uh, a hoist and you're usually impressive at Newbury. Um, you know, but again, there has to be a little bit of a concern about the ground. We, we you know we've seen him pulled out previously when they've deemed they deemed good to soft ground unsuitable, let alone good. Um, and you know, can he go? You know, is is he going to? Operate okay right-handed. He, he unseated the last time he's gone um, right-handed. He, he's he unseated in a point once as well. So you know, um, jumping you know concerns. You're talking about you know five to four on and five to four against. Do you really you know 
fantastic horses they might be and potential Gold Cup horses in the future. But do you really want to be backing them in a race like this in Grade 1 company at those sort of silly prices? Um, I'd say no. Um, and the, the one I thought you had to back is three under through five, who, um, again, will Nichols run two? Will he, will he take on? Um, you know, brave man's game, but this race hasn't off. You know, hasn't always gone to um, you know uh, to the market leaders. There's been plenty of sort of shock stroke minor upsets. Um, you know, a lot of those trained by Paul Nichols. So you've got a horse here who um, jumps out to his right. It's four from four right-handed and three under through five. And yet, um, you know, since that extra win, he's won twice left-handed, probably despite not enjoying the course. So. This, this is a horse who's got a fantastic strike rate. I think he's got a superior um, wins-to-runs ratio to, to, to most of these in, in the race. And, you know, if they all line up, he's 6-1 to one against, you know, horses that are hovering around the even money mark. So it's, it's a no-brainer in terms of value. that You've got to be with three under through five. Ooh. Andrew Mount has been inhaling an awful lot of frankincense and myrrh these last few weeks, it turns out. <laughs> but I'm but joking, we're going to score gold, though. Yeah, exactly. Not missing out the gold. No, I, I jest, of course. Fascinating there. And obviously plenty of people looking to take on the two short price horses there at the head of a market in a hoist and you're a brave man's game. And Andrew is then going with three under through five, which is uh, really interesting. I just say he's done nothing wrong with his last few starts. I just thought he looked a bit slow, but he may well be more suited to this track than the other two and to the ground as well. Daryl, yourself, please. <laughs> Oh, you don't have to have a bet in every race, there, do. <laughs> but uh, this, this is this is what a clash! This is this is a brilliant race. Um, this is not always as good uh, as this over the years. I think these two at the top of the market are definitely the two to uh, two to be focusing on. Um, it's very tricky, though. Like Andrew said, it, it, to give him credit, it is very tricky. A horse in your. Um, I got him completely wrong at, at Newbury. That was a fantastic performance from him. You go back. I went back and watched Carlisle run as well uh, earlier today when he unseated, and uh, I think he was just being asked for a bit more as he unseated. So I don't mm. think he was beaten when he was unseated. Uh, I thought that trip two and a half was on the sharp side for him as well. Uh, and you go back to that entry run where he beat Brave Man's Game by seven lengths, and there was very few excuses for Brave Man's Game, albeit it did come after Cheltenham. So you could probably, you know. I, I mean, I put it down to end of season form. I did at the time. But I, I'm completely wrong with that. I've got to be honest, because the hoist in yours has got some ending. Now, mm. the issue I have with a, a hoist in your is the track. And I mentioned earlier about turning into that home straight. You haven't got a lot of time to get yourself organised to jump that first fence in the home straight. A hoist in your has made plenty of mistakes at his fences. That, that, that's without a shadow of a doubt. But on the flip side of that, He's got some engine to be able to make those mistakes and still produce the performance and the time figure he did at Newbury. Now, in complete contrast, when you look at Brave Man's game, he's done absolutely nothing wrong. He jumps beautifully. He'll jump lovely round Kempton. Um, there'll be little to worry about if, if you're backing him. But what I would just say with Brave Man's game is we don't know what he's got under the bonnet when he makes that mistake. And we've said this before, I think, me and you, when we were talking about him for... Um, for, Hay for the Haydock race. Uh, he, and he didn't make a mistake there, but it is going to happen sooner rather than later. Now, we don't want a horse to fall or anything like that, but I'm talking about if he, if he misses a stride, he gets one wrong, he gets in tight, and he's got to react from that. Um, how much has he got left over this three-mile trip if something like that happens under pressure? That would be my concern with him. Uh, but you can't, we kind of want to see it because I do want to see mm -hmm. what he's got to fight back with. A hoist in your, we know, if he clatters three or four, he's going to be galloping all the way anyway. Um, like Andrew said, whether this tight track will, will, will suit him, I don't know. I did look at his action as he was going left-handed. He's very much a left four lead. Uh, I watched him going right-handed at Carlisle. He didn't look as comfortable. Um, I can sort of, now I'm talking about it, I can sort of see where Andrew's going for this time. Trying to take them on at the well, top of the Again, market. you look at some of the... I mean, we've had one favourite in the last eight years. I mean, Santini was 11 to 10 for this. And um, with the hindsight, you think... How the devil was he that? <laughs> Na Native River was beaten as the six to four favourite, you know, be behind T for two. T for two, who was a multiple Kempton winner and um, had plenty of form right handed, but also won at Huntington. Native, you know, River, grinder, heavy ground, flat galloping left handed track or, you know, undulating left handed track. Um, so, you know, th there's, I'm not for one minute suggesting that fast forward a year, Brave Man's Game and Ahoy Senor won't be the two, you know, the best horses to come out of this race. But it's all about conditions on the day. 
both of them are going to be having right. ground that's probably too quick for them. And um, one of them, at least, might prefer going the other way around. So it's, it all comes down to the price. If they were seven to two and four to one, I'll back them both. But they're not. They're both <laughs> around about five to four on or five to four against. So uh, yeah. I agree. And that was the reason that. why this wasn't a betting race for me. Um, I'm fascinated to see what happened. Because you looked down the list. I thought Miller's bank was quite interesting as well. He's got a lovely way of going about him over fences. Uh, T-Clippers, no mud. 300 through five. They're all of a level. But what we're looking for is we're actually looking for that standout candidate now. Now, whether this is the trap to actually find it at, um, I don't know, because it, it, it does become a specialist track, Kempton, a speed track, a fluid jumping track. Uh, look, I, I expect a hoist in George to go out in front. I expect him probably to be tough to catch. I expect Braidman's going to stalk him all the way. Uh, I think I think a horse in yours is going to win. Yeah. But I, I'm not I'm not having a bet in the race. I just want to I just want to watch it um, simply <laughs> on a price basis. So yeah, but I hope a horse in your wins and confirms the fall from entry. Yeah, it is. It is absolutely fascinating. Both lads have assessed it in a really uh, in a really nice way there, just to appreciate the race more so than even from a betting perspective. But I say every horse has its price and Andrew's given you one. If you don't want to take the two shorter priced uh, horses that seemingly have the race between them, you know, if you sort of believe everything you read and see. But there is another angle in into the race because the pair of them do still have questions to have to answer here. And it is just going to be fascinating to see who comes out on top of the staying novice chases. So we'll move on then to... The 2.30 at Kempton. This is another small field grade one in the Christmas hurdle over two miles where we have just the six runners at this stage. But, Daryl, I, I actually thought you made a really good point earlier this week by asking, but who else would you, in the country, who else would you have mm. to turn up in this race? And that's a reflection of a small pool of two-mile hurdlers we have or don't have in this country at the minute, especially with dear old Silver Streak, unfortunately, passing mm. away. And so Royal not turning up here as he ran in the international hurdle just two weeks ago, which does leave the favourite epitont, well, as, as the likely short price favourite. But, Daryl, do you keep her on side to build on that dead heat uh, from the re-opposing not-so-sleepy here, or do you look elsewhere? Uh, yeah, do you know what? I, I do. I do keep, I do keep on side for mm. this. I think I think she's a, the best of a, of a, a below-par bunch, really. I mean, I said this when I had the, the Epiton rant the other week about why she won the champion earlier because we had no outstanding two-milers. And we, we don't at the moment. I think she... Uh, I think I think last time at Newcastle, I thought coming to the second last, I, I understand what Aidan said when he said, I got there too early. He wasn't meaning at the end of the race. He was mean, he was meaning at the second last. Mm. He was jumping up. His jump at the second last would have pretty much almost took him to the front um, going down to the last. So he, he held on and held on and held on. And I, I could see what he means because he, he, he got sort of like hampered then he had to switch and then he had to go. It was a bit messy, but, but I thought it was enough to expect Epiton to go on to win this Christmas hurdle. Um, but but make no mistake about it, she's winning it because of the lack of depth in the race. Do you yeah. know what? If she was mine, right, she's got, she's got a rate of 153. If she was mine, I would get, I wouldn't get her beat. You can't say things like that. <laughs> uh, I would, I would look for a handicap for her. Um, I, I would, off this, off this sort of mark of 153. Um, but at the moment, if you can win grade one, Below par grade ones, what, why wouldn't you? You know, um, Goshen is is in here. I don't really know what happened at well, Ascot, do you? Um, I, I mean, Gary Moore said that he's, he's not a boat, but you know, give him a couple of rowing oars, he needs enough water, doesn't he? He's, <laughs> you know, I think he's going to go up and trip. I do think he's going to go up and trip. I think he couldn't keep keep up with the pace of, of the race that Ascot in, in the handicap one by one yeah. by Tritonic. Tritonic's obviously very interesting running in here eight days later, quick turnaround. Soaring Glory, I think Soaring Glory could be being plotted. Um, he's off a mark of 149. Betfair hurdles in February, which he mm. won last year. Um, I wouldn't be I wouldn't be back in Soaring Glory at the moment. Um, just I'd just be keeping him a close eye on him. Uh, not so sleepy he's going to be there to try and make the run in. I assume Goshen will go forward as well, but I just think I just think Epiton should be winning this. And I think the quicker the ground, the better for her, to be quite honest. <laughs> 
yeah, yeah, definitely. So I totally agree there. And as I say, it's sort of a bit of a non-event in that sense. And then the mm. fact, like you say, keep not soaring glory, just keep an eye, but wouldn't be backing him at this stage. And gosh, and if he does make this quick turnaround, um, will be fascinating to see if him back over two miles again as he get, gets released on day release from his um, mental asylum. Andrew, yourself, please, talking of released uh, from day release. <laughs> yeah, quite, uh, fascinating races. There's two I didn't like. Tritonic, he's a four-year-old. Uh, then naught from 17 in this race, um, naught from 19 if you count the, the time it was run in January when it was abandoned at Christmas and um, yeah, they'd only just turned five. So I, I think it's a bit of an afterthought. And um, again, uh, Alan King says he can go to sleep in his races. And uh, you look at his record in smallish fields, seven or fewer runners, flat and jumps, he's got beaten every single time. He does seem to sort of switch off perhaps when there aren't horses around him to keep him interested. Mm. So I didn't think um, it would be run to suit him. Goshen can't win. His next win will come to point to point when he's 13 years old. Uh, Dar Daryl's right. He's a boat as in slow as one. I mean, for goodness sake. I mean, why people were falling over themselves to back him at Ascot last week, Christ only knows. I mean, you'd think these people would have learnt or uh, gone skimp by now and gone away. Um, but, uh, uh, as, I mean, as, as for who's going to win, Soaring Glory is very interesting, but his best efforts have tended to come in big fields off a strong pace. And we saw it Newby, uh, Newbury behind, um, you know, one for the road. He's finished last of four. I think it was favourite for that event. Just wasn't run to suit. He needs an end-to-end -end gallop. You could argue that because he's stepping up into grade one company, they might go quicker. But then you look back at the fighting fifth, and it's basically the same field. The fighting fifth, there was a 200 to one shot. Uh, it was probably a thousand painted on Betfair during the race. who was in contention and about two lengths behind them on turning in. They just crawled. It was a farce. And of course, who's won it? Well, two horses, Epiton and Not So Sleepy. One of them is five to four on, the other one's 100 to 30. So, I mean, there's only one bet you can have here, really, which is Not So Sleepy. Mm -hmm. He's probably going to get a relatively soft lead. If he gets taken on by Goshen, he'll just laugh at him. Um, <laughs> and, you know, I mean, like you say, you know, Goshen, you, you know, he, he could make a case for backing him in a cellar if it was heavy ground, but uh, you know, a, 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 great, a great one hurdle, you, 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 you need to. You need your bumps fell if you want to back him for this. So really, I mean, you know, I know he's a nine-year-old, not so sleepy, but he goes well right-handed. He's in form. Um, I don't think he's, um, since his hurdling debut, I don't think he's ever lost in November and December. He goes well this time of year. I mean, you know, th think back to that um, Ascot hurdle, um, handicap hurdle, you know, last year when everyone said he can't possibly stage a repeat because there's a million other front runners in opposition. And what did he do? He just, he just laughed at them from the front. So... Uh, I th think if you can get seven or two, maybe four to one, not so sleepy back him each way, you know, a quarter one, two, I think he, he's a great bet. And, you know, do bear in mind, Epiton got beat five to one on in this race last season mm -hmm. when Silver Streak, um, God rest his soul, was given a fantastic front running ride, a horse who was normally held up. Uh, Adam Wedge was, um, you know, uh, alive to the fact that small field Kempton races are often won by front runners. So uh, it's got to be not so sleepy each way, none of the bet. Yep, to try and make all there. And as you say, God help Gosh, and if he tries to go with not so sleepy, he wouldn't have the pace to even go with him. Should he try and mount a challenge, don't think? And that is definitely Andrew crossed off of Gary Moore's Christmas list as well with that uh, with that assessment of Gosh's chances, but probably very true, to be honest. So, yep, not so sleepy then for Andrew. Andrew, I will come back to you for <laughs> anything else then from Kempton, please. Um, no, nothing for me. Thank you, Kate. No problemo. Daryl, yourself, please, from Kempton? No, no, nothing from me. Thank you. No, we have no way of really knowing what's even going to turn up in any yeah, of the exactly. races, so it's probably very sensible. So we'll move on to Weatherby. This is our only scheduled race on Boxing Day that comes from Weatherby in the form of the Roland Merrick Handicap Chase, which is a grade three handicap for four-year-olds and over, over three miles. This looks wide open again. So, Daryl, back to you, please, for this Weatherby feature. Yeah, I like Silver, uh, Silver Hallmark. He said Silver Strickland. Oh. Uh, Silver Hallmark. Um, he's got two entries, so where he goes, nobody knows. But three <laughs> miles, I do think, is, is going to be his trip going forward. Uh, he's very, very unexposed. He, he's had, what, six races under rules. Um, he's, he's won three of them, two of them. Um, He's a really nice horse. I thought the run at Carlisle in, in what was a really hot Colin Parker, I thought, um, mm. was quite eye-catching. I just thought he blew up towards the towards the end of the race, and I didn't quite think he had the pace to challenge. I've always thought this horse would be a, would be a three-miler since he um, since he ran at uh, Haydock on heavy ground, beating the horse called Marone uh, in a very good time figure. That suggests 
that he, he will definitely get the trip, even on this uh, slightly slightly better ground here. He's, he is a really nice horse. I, when we went up to um, up to uh, Fergal O'Brien's uh, last year, I asked him about this horse, and he just said he's a really talented horse. He just he has a lot of problems. He's very hard to get yeah. right. But once he's on song, he's great. It's just hard to keep right. Uh, he's only a seven-year-old. He's off a handicap mark of 145. He's definitely better than that. He's surely mm. a 150 horse. I think improvement is to come at three miles. Uh, I'd be interested in him, but obviously price dictates everything, and I can't even see a price for him at the minute. No, I haven't got prices for any of these as of yet. But yeah, Silver Hallmark hopefully goes here. But as you say, just as I mentioned, that he is also entered at Chepstow on Monday, the 27th of December, and a handicap chase there as well. And that's sort of an issue we really have with a few of these runners because the horse that I really liked in this was Fortescue, who ticks all the boxes for me in this race. But he's also in the Welsh Grand National and he's also in a Kempton handicap chase on Monday as well. But if he does turn up in the role of Merrick, then Fortescue would be the one that took my interest. Andrew, yourself, please. Yeah, Fortescue's on my shortlist for this. Ooh, um, wonderful. He, he was far from disgraced in the Labrooks Trophy at Newbury, finishing mm -hmm. seventh, beating 40-odd lengths, but obviously um, this is a, a weaker race. But the key to him, I think, is the small field. Um, he didn't you know, stay on until the field had thinned out in Newbury. He's only ever won in fields of nine or fewer runners, so uh, I've got him marked down as one to punt over the Christmas period if he gets a smallish field. Even in the Welsh National, you know, if he survives the early stages and the field thins out, horses pull up and fall, then he could do what he did at Newbury, stay on, you know, maybe get into the first four or five. But if this cuts up to sort of seven, eight runners, as it often does, and he comes here, then I'll be very interested. Now, the, the other two are a couple of previous winners. Uh, Lakeview Lad, who won this in 2018. Four of his last five wins have come in December. It goes well this time of year. Nick Alexander's in fantastic form. He had three winners and a second air on um, uh, Tuesday this week when uh, the, the only one of his that wasn't in the frame was the one I put up as an each-way bet. Uh -huh. um, but th there you go. And um, the other one, of course, Topville Ben, uh, who fell at Aintree last time, he won this two years ago off a higher mark and you know he likes going left-handed and uh, likes the mud as well. And they're calling it soft at the moment. If they get any more rain, he could go well. So, yeah, Fortescue, Topville Ben, Lakeview Lad, just on a tentative shortlist at this stage. Yeah, and so it is definitely a tentative shortlist, isn't it? You love Top Bill Ben, don't you? And yeah, and if he does get another run here, this may well suit him. Um, off that cliff, off that cliff, off that cliff. <laughs> <laughs> good on Top Bill Ben. We know he'll come good at one point, and Andrew will be the only one laughing because yeah, I... maybe he'll beat Goshen in a point to point. <laughs> Exactly, two lunatics together then. Topville, Ben and Gosham. Jesus, what are we looking forward to? Um, yes, yeah, so that is then covering the rolling merit. But as I say, then for me, it is going to be Fortescue. Hopefully he gets a run here and hopefully he can buck that trend as Andrew makes a very good point there about him with small runner fields. But I hope that the way that he, even though he's ridden, up, ridden in rear last time out in the Labrooks Trophy, I've sort of marked him up on that basis more so than anything else because he was completely against the pace bias. But as you say, Andrew, he did then come through and pick up the pieces when the field was thinning out but this race can very often lend itself to a hold up performer so that may well fall into his favour as well should he get a run here so Andrew back to you for anything else from Weatherby yeah uh, 245 oh. unexpected party for no. Skelton now this, <laughs> this is a horse who let me down for a treble in my column um, six weeks ago so I might be talking from my wallet but um, it was a massive eye catcher when winning here uh, on his penultimate start he raced in the swamp in the inside uh, the charlie hall meeting when it paid to be as wide as possible on the hurdles track he's gone to cheltenham and i thought well he, he was prominent when he won it um weatherby surely they'll notice there's no pace in this race and he'll race prominently bridget mm. andrews held him up out the back of the telly she's then tried to make ground around the inside of the track when it was um you know, um, was sort of in Paddy Brennan wide as possible territory at Cheltenham. Gal Road made pretty much all the running, stayed wide, and uh, you know it was it was an ill-judged ride. But like I say, I might be talking from a wallet. So yeah, unexpected party. A handicap mark of 124 is, I think, massively underestimates his ability. He's one of the bets of the uh, of Boxing Day. Ooh, one of the bets of Boxing Day then for unexpected party in the 2:45 at Weatherby. Daryl, did you agree? Was that a grimace of agreement or of disagreement? Yes. That's what I was going to say. It's one of the bets of Boxing Day. Ah, oh, four pounds for that Cheltenham run. I'll tell you what, he's much, much better than that. Mm. Definitely much better than that. Having to come from the rear of the field the way he did in the steadily run race. My God, Harry Skelton back on, back at Weatherby, where he was an eight level winner the time before. I mean, I can't add too much more to what Andrew said, really, but he, surely this is a 130 plus horse. So he's at least six, 
I reckon he's about ten pound. Higher, well in. higher. <laughs> yeah, I reckon, I, well, I reckon he's about ten pound. Well in, uh, and Ooh. he's young. He's unexposed. My God, go back and watch that Shelton run and see how we came come up that hill. Mm. You don't see horses coming up that hill like that every every day. Um, the one I would just fear in the race would be Hillcrest for for Henry Daly, who's uh, another unexposed horse off a mark of one two two eight. Um, he looks pretty nice as well. But I'm hoping we can have a good Boxing Day drink on unexpected. I thought you were going to say an unexpected party. Yes. Oh, no. I, that was the obvious has... segue. Goodness sake, what have you been on now? Oh, only, has... on the brain. only if it has cheese and wine can we have an unexpected party at this time of year. We'll have an unexpected work meeting. An unexpected board meeting. That's a, that's a more apt name, isn't it, for the Christmas period? <laughs> both, both of the lads then siding with unexpected party. And we love it when they agree, and especially this early on, and when they make such uh, when they make such a shout as well for the horses with such evidence. Um, then we really like that for unexpected party in the 2.45 at Weatherby. So, Daryl, back to you, please, for anything else from Boxing Day. Yes, I've just, I'm just Ooh. gutted that Harry's not going to be on. Um, Market raising 105. He's got two entries. He's entered at Wincanton as well. Toke Doke. Um, okay. I put him up. I put him up 17 days ago, uh, and he, I don't know what has sort of happened. He ran a really, really nice race and just looked like he needed it. Now, before that was his second start of the season, but he'd been off a long, long time before that. So I, I just think he's going to progress from that. He is. A, if you haven't seen this horse jump a fence, go and watch it. He. A natural chaser. He is definitely better than a mark of 120. I'm hoping that Bridget Andrews can get the job done. Uh, and there's no need for, for Harry Skelton. But um, this horse, it, I just want them to ride him prominently. Keep it simple. He's better than his handicap mark. Just let him go and jump and, and travel and win. Because mm -hmm. this is not a strong race at market raising. The one he goes to at wind camp is a little bit deeper. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see where he goes. But, but Toke Doke. Uh, 105 market raising sticking with yeah, the track so, for, for Fox Day. Doki Doki at market raising in the 105. Very interesting. Andrew, yourself, please. Or anything else from Boxing Day? Um, just Wolverhampton, three o'clock, Soldiers Minute um, for the Keith Dale Gleash Yard in this condition sprint. Um, was favourite for a race at Lingfield the other day and went round the inside in the swamp. And uh, so obviously sort of draw dependent. I mean, watching Wolverhampton this afternoon, my goodness, if you're anywhere near the inside rail, you haven't got a prayer. So hopefully a sort of middle draw and a switch wide for a run. Yep, so Soldier's Minute there in the three o'clock at Wolverhampton. So we shall move on to the 27th of December now, where again, we are still guessing as much as anything on what horses are likely to turn up. So do bear with us with selections. This is just to, again, just give an idea of the races we have to look forward to. And I and Sorry, I'm... Kate, just, just putting the overtime clock on here now. With the, <laughs> with the data, so. We shall skim through these last few races then as Andrew is on a... Uh, <laughs> is on a mission to, to get down to a pub to start his Christmas festivities. So we shall start then at Chepso in the 140. And this is the finale juvenile hurdle, an easy opener then on the 27th for the lads to solve in the form of this grade one for three year olds over two miles. Whole host of last time out winners. Who knows how good any of these are at this stage. Hopefully this might establish a hierarchy. So Andrew, I challenge you of this race, please. Yeah, the uh, tricky one. I mean, Porticello has beaten at Doncaster when the first three have finished in a bit of a heap. I wasn't usually taken by that form. I was more interested in Skycutter, who was very impressive uh, um, well, um, the last twice. Parliament Hill I wanted to be against. I thought he might have been flattered by racing wide at Leicester on the better ground. Forever Blessed was, or Forever Blessed, whichever way you want to go with that one, was impressive at Sandown and sort of is in the could-be-anything category. But... Um, appropriate after Tom Segal's tipping performance for the Racing Post price-wise last week, <laughs> Saint Segal. Yes. Um, Jane Williams and Nick Williams, they don't tilt at windmills. And when they put a horse into graded company on their second career start, uh, regardless of what they did first time out, whether they you know, finished down the field of a maiden hurdle or won as um, Saint Segal did a banger, then uh, they usually run well. So um, I'll, I'll go for um, Saint Segal here, but it's a very tricky race, this one. Yeah, Saint Segal was the horse I really liked because apparently he wasn't even 100% fit for that debut start. He still has plenty more to come. They were quite amazed how well he did that on what little work he did going into the race. So hopefully he's a machine. Daryl, yourself, please. <laughs> yeah, I, I like similar thoughts about Saint Segal, but um, I, I thought Porticillo was probably worth another chance. 
I thought the way he stuck on at Doncaster uh, behind Night Salute was quite high catching. I thought he's still very green. I think this track will suit him. The down the thing with Chepstow though is it's very difficult for these um, for these youngsters because they, they mm-hmm. run downhill for so long and then they're asked to jump a fence and their inexperience can just really show. For instance, Forever Blessed. I'm not. He's a big big horse. I'm not sure he's going to handle that sort of downhill run. Um, he's all right going up the hill at Sand now, but whether he's going to be all right coming down it at Chepstow, I, I don't know. It's not a race I like, Kate. You know I don't like these juveniles. Yeah. They're, they're over, <laughs> they're over bloody rated, over priced. Over <laughs> eggs. Oh. Uh, give a chance. Don't give him a chance to pull to Silo. It looks like he's getting better with every run. So yeah. And and Daryl's favourite division, as we've been, as we've cleared up in the last few weeks on this podcast, for juveniles in this country, he just loves and they're rated perfectly. If, if, if anything, it's underestimating them. So we're for the jello then for Daryl at this stage. We shall move on to Chepstow's feature race of the entire season. The Welsh holds this race in dearly. It's going to be a huge shame we're not going to get any crowds at the Welsh Grand National this year, but it's still going to be a fascinating contest nonetheless. Plenty of characters we absolutely adore in here Daryl so for all and say it is a shame we're not going to get the crowds it is going to be a fantastic a fun, fascinating even contest nonetheless isn't it yeah this is a cracker um loads of old favorites in here uh, I think Potter's Corner's got a massive chance um he was he's four for five at Chepstow two for two on the, on the chase course won this in 2019 he's now 13 pounds lower he's for one of the best trainers in the land in Christian Williams who just mm-hmm. It's remarkable some of the things Christian Williams can do with, with some of these horses, I tell you. Uh, Native Rivers, obviously very interesting. Two 11-year-olds I mentioned there. Native River won this off top weight in, in 2016. Um, he's obviously the class act in the field, isn't he? I, I can't wait to watch him in this. I don't know. I haven't got a clue how he's going to go. I don't know if he's going <laughs> to win by six lengths or he's going to be fouled off. But I, I can't wait to see him. Uh, the one yeah. I want to give a chance to is one of a big, big price. Um, Eva's Oscar. Oh, that's on my shortlist. Yeah, <laughs> he was Oscar. I think this horse has just been crying out for a for a um, for a mammoth trip. This horse just sort of has one gear, it doesn't really have a, a change of foot, just has one gear and just gallops and gallops and gallops. Uh, and this is the first time they're going beyond like three miles, three miles one and a half. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think this this stamina test will definitely suit, definitely suit this horse. That's for sure. Uh, I thought when he was beaten last time, there was plenty of encouragement to take from that run behind Coach Ram. But I just thought he was just sticking on um, at the finish. If you watch Coach Ramble, it looks like Coach Ramble is going away from him. But if you watch him in comparison to the third and fourth, he's actually going away from them as well. Mm. So it was a good performance by the winner. Um, I thought it was just a good performance by Ives Oscar as well. Um, he won't mind what the ground does. He's due to about three pounds in the weight. Things on a very fair mark. Two good wins here at Chepstow on his last two visits. Uh, good ground and heavy ground. He's only a seven-year-old. I respect all of these in here. There's loads in here you could like. Kimber, like Candy's another one you can mention. There's loads of horses you can give a chance to in here. Mm-hmm. Um, but I just think there's more to come from Eva's Oscar. I, I've always liked this horse a little bit, and I think Mammoth Trips could just be the making of this horse. So big price, 33-1. to Roll the dice on Boxing Day. Yes. So roll the Boxing Day dice that you're probably getting a cracker. Um, yeah, these crappy little ones. Yeah, Eva's Oscar was one of them on my short list as well as Hill 16, but my main Hill bet 16. is probably... Yeah, it, but my main <laughs> bet is probably going to be Daisha Abba anyway. So they were my three. So I'm happy you've given a nod to two of them anyway, Daryl. Andrew, do you agree with us or are you looking elsewhere? Yeah, I've, um, I, I like Eva's Oscar. The only, only reason I haven't bet him yet is because he's also in the 325. So mm. uh, yeah. there's just a concern that he, he might end up in that as well. So it makes... And to post betting risky. I mean, the key to this race, although we had a 13 year old Irish donkey win it a few years ago, <laughs> speaking, old you, 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 you want to be with a, a young horse and um, you know, just back in horses aged six, seven, or eight, uh, top four finish last time out. They'd had a recent outing within 28 days, you'd made a good profit over the years and um, and also um, hit plenty of placed horses at big prices. So, Eva's Oscar falls into that category. Eva's Oscars had three runs in handicap company at Chepstow, hurdles and fences combined. He's won all three. And as Gall- uh, Daryl says, it just keeps galloping. Um, I Will Do It was another one that I was interested in because of his impressive course win last time out. There was a bit of a worry that he couldn't go back to back. But when you look at the times he's come back soon after a win and often disappointed, as often it's because he's come back too quickly. This time he's had a proper break in between uh, races. Django was another one as well, ran about 100 to 1 for the pipe yard. And, yes, yeah. um, you know, uh, his, his form in France was on um, deep ground. He he's, uh, made his British debut at Wincanton last time, stayed on into fourth position from off the pace. 
and you know he's, he's the kind of horse that could um, could go well at a big price with ground to suit. So so it was Eva's Oscar. Uh, I will do it in Django in that order. At the head of the market, there's horses that you, you you wouldn't be surprised if they won, like Highland Hunter, who likes the ground. But then you look, you think, well, he fell at this meeting last year, um, in, in the uh, um, in one of the other races, and um, you know he's been mostly campaigned right-handed since, so maybe he doesn't like going this way round. Hold that taut, um, Venetia Williams, prominent to the betting, three from three on his seasonal debuts, if you include his point-to-point season. Never won outside of his um, first uh, his first time start. Secret reprieve, yeah, impressive last year, winning from off the pace. Not always to do easy to do here, but we haven't seen him since. So these horses are priced at sort of five to one, seven to one, and eight to one. What and do you make of the big dog? Um, uh, once it's the last time out effort that was uh, you know sort of a bit of a concern, but any Irish handicapper in a British race at the moment, you've got to give respect to. But again, it all comes down to the price and. You know, they're going to be falling over themselves to offer you sort of five, six, seven places. And five, six, seven is more people than will be at the track on the day, uh, unfortunately. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so I'd, I'd, I'd much rather stab, stab out a few sort of, you know, small bets at massive prices with extra places on offer. Like the Eva's Oscar, I will do it, and uh, Django's of the world. Yep. Yeah, I was going to say all three of those and at huge prices, especially Django at 100 to 1 currently. But do keep an eye on double entries for a lot of these horses. But yes, so we all agree, though, on a few bigger price horses for the Welsh Grand National. So, Andrew, I'll pass it back to you, please, for anything else from Chepstow. Um, 325, we, we touched on because Eva's Oscar's also entered in that. I think Fortescue's in that race as well, um, as, as it um, said, Fortescue, because in the Welsh National. Uh, Mario de Pale um, for... Um, what's his name? Uh, Sam Thompson. Yeah. Um, yeah, I put him up as a bet here last time out. He fell fairly early. He was a big eye catcher at Foss Lass on his return. Always needs his first run back, and he's finished second, second of four. And um, it was a good effort in the circumstances, given he wasn't fit. And uh, he will be winning races again soon, perhaps at three twenty-five. Yep, Mario De Pale then in the 325 in colours of the Walters and Potters group, which actually look quite like the jumpers that we're wearing, Andrew. So, yeah, we, we look like we're representing ready. <laughs> it was all thought out. Uh, Daryl, yourself, please, for anything else from Chetstow. Um, no, but I am, not yet, but I am interested in the uh, in the 105 at Chetstow. There's going to be, um, mm -hmm. obviously, loads of these that have got a double entry, so yeah. I can't give you any sort of inkling, but... It's a very, very good race. Fernando Civil is in there as well. Zambi mm -hmm. Fix are the two that I'm keeping an eye on. Silver Hallmark's at the head of the market, but I want to see him go up and trip. So if he doesn't go up and trip and he comes in here, I want to kind of take him on. So yeah. it's, uh, I'm, I'm just trying to weigh a few things up. It's weird at the minute, isn't it? Because you kind of feel like all, you feel like you're in a rush, but you've got mm. nothing to rush for because you're, you're waiting for this to, yeah. to all cut up and the final decks come through. So it's a very strange feeling at the moment. Daryl, yeah, you, it... you haven't got kids, have you? No. Yeah, you got Christmas Day to um to study then. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, I, listen, I've got I've got loads going on. I've got to do columns of Boxing Day, Monday, Tuesday, Christmas mm. Eve. So I'm I'm not going to get a Christmas Day. Really. Well, I will get Christmas Day, but not. But spare a thought, viewers and listeners out there, for those of us who do work in racing, that Christmas isn't Christmas. Christmas is one of the busiest days looking ahead to Boxing Day for all of us. So you can, it you is. Can go, you can go to the website and you can donate a pound to sponsor us. Yes. As well. Please do, exactly. Please do for our poor souls who, who still have to look around ho uh, horses running around a field on Christmas Day to give you some winners, hopefully, for Boxing Day. So we will move on to the 2.30 at Kempton. This is our final scheduled race. This is the Grade 2 Desert Orchid Chase for four-year-olds and over over two miles, where we may we, we may get to see Shishkin actually finally out. Um, but I say I wouldn't hold your breath too much, especially as Nicky Henderson did comment earlier on in the week that we're not going to run him unless he's ready so who knows we may get a late christmas present if he does then turn up here but we're not entirely sure so daryl will we see him and if we do does he win i don't, I don't know i don't know if we see him or not it's a, it's a complete toss-up isn't it um if we see him i mean he's a monster isn't he, he, he yeah. he's an absolute beast he he is just so powerful um do you know what, though? It, it is strange. He does very much remind me of Altu, and I know a lot of people mm. have made that connection. And one of the things about him is it looks like he wants to go up and trip. Do you know what I mean? If you mm. go back and watch his run where he was, um, he, he'd only beat Fernando Civilla last time at Aintree. It just looked like he wanted to go up and trip. He looked like he killed the race in the last part of, part of the race. It looked like mm. Altu did. He used to just travel, travel, and then kill it in that final 
yeah, hundred yards. Have that flat um, spot and then go again. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I just wonder if that's it's so similar. It, yeah, it's, it's remarkable. I thought the betting here would be for an amble similar. Um, mm-hmm. And I, I'm waiting. I don't know whether it's going to be without Chiskin or it's going to be to take him on. He's only got three levels to find him, right? And now I know he's going to need more than a three-pound turnaround mm-hmm. with him for that. But I just think he's such a progressive horse. Um, he, he ran at Huntington last time. He beat him by first play, but that was over two and a half miles. I don't know what on earth they were thinking about going over two and a half miles. He's a two-miler. You watch the way he jumps a fence. He's fast. He's fluent through the air. Short, sharp stride. He's very, very quick. Uh, he's definitely a two-miler. And bumping into Shishkin at Andrew doesn't mean they should go and look for other options for him, as far as I'm concerned. I think he's got every right to be in it. I think he'll finish ahead of Grenatine. I don't think this this sharp two-mile Kempton track is Grenatine's bag at all. I think mm-hmm. uh, six to one uh, looks a fair price. I wonder what he'll be without Shishkin. That, that's what I'm going to take a look at, because I think he's the most likely horse to finish second to him. But he does have a fitness edge on Shishkin. And, mm. you know, and given Nicky Henderson's horses haven't been on the grass or whatever, look, I'm trying to find kinks in the armour of Shishkin, ultimately. You, you don't need to, because he's not going to run, is he? We won't see him until he runs well, the Jumpers it, it, exactly. in February or race course <laughs> Gallop at Newbury. <laughs> if he yeah. doesn't run, it'd make it um, healthier for my wallet, I, I, I would think. Because <laughs> um, I do like Fernando Silva. But we do want to see Shishkin. We do want to see these horses. And he is he is a remarkable horse. He, it, there's no getting away from it. He's a mm-hmm. fantastic horse. But um, I might actually I might go and have an anti post bet. Now, keep keep yeah. talking for sixty seconds, down until the five furlong race at Wolverhampton's finished. Okay, <laughs> I might go and have a I might go and have a, a little anti post bet at six to one now. I'm, I'm, oh, I can't because he might go elsewhere. He's got du- everyone's got bloody double entries, Kate. Yeah, it's such a nightmare, isn't it? Because like you say, you feel. <laughs> throw down your pen in anger it's the okay, so isn't it like you say you feel like you're in a rush to in case uh, horses do come out and other horses go elsewhere and then you lose your anti-post price about a horse but at the same time you don't know if your then selection's going to be going elsewhere so you, it is it, like say you're rushing but you it's, it, it's still a toss-up <laughs> it is you know what we should have uh, revolted to gg and said no final declarations please Give us some damn respect. <laughs> but unfortunately, by the time we get the final decks, Kate's going to be upside down at a wedding, so I wouldn't have made it. Oh, yes, um, you are, aren't you? Yeah, oh, that's, that's, right. why, that's why we're doing it today. Oh, so it's your fault. Full responsibility. <laughs> I'm so sorry, lads. Um, but yeah, Funnam Bowl Savola is fascinating, especially because he did probably far too much too soon, as you say, over an unsuitable trip in the Peterborough chase last time out. Just got racing way too early, so this should suit him much more. And Andrew, is celebrating or despairing on the back of his tip in the five furlong race at Wolverhampton, Andrew? Celebrating yeah, bit, or despairing? Well, a bit of both. It was, yeah, um, it was, I've, I've laid Tipperary Tiger because he's up uh, in the swamp on the inside rail, but I've also laid in place as well. He's managed to hold on for second, so uh, <laughs> uh, pros and cons. Um, yeah, come back to this race. I mean, uh, one interesting aspect about uh, Grenatine is uh, four wins from five when Brindy's riding and um, a horse who can race very keenly. And uh, she didn't manage to get him saddled first time out in the um, Halden Gold Cup when the stable had a shorter price one in Hitman. Uh, reversed the form impressively in the Tingle Creek. And is she the key to him? Uh, I, I wouldn't be surprised to see him follow up here if he does settle. Shishkin, if he turns up, yeah, he'll probably win, won't he, just about? I mean, he did jump out to his left at Aintree last time, but I think that was because he was following Gumball and was towards his inside, and he didn't do that quite as markedly once he got to the lead and he got on that inside rail. But that's just something worth keeping an eye on. And if he is going to get beat, it'll be sort of, you know, first time outside of novice company, or, you know, in the thought we see it time and time again. Um, Funambul Sivler I really like as well. He's massively impressive finishing second in the Peterborough chase when they've gone off like the absolute clappers and he's one of the ones to dispute the lead and finish second, um, splitting horses who've come from miles back. So, um, yeah, Funambul Sivler, you know, Granatine, I don't think we'll see Shishkin until February. Yeah, he's what? hoping, but you have to expect it at the same time. Do you honestly not think we're going to see him? He, he won't turn up until February. Then a jumpers bump up or a race course gallop at Newbury. <laughs> <laughs> it was the story that came out in the week that just teased it. And you just thought, oh, not again, please. Please, can we just see him? But anyway, that's just us, you know, wanting to see a superstar of the sport. I don't think we're being greedy by asking for that. We're just huge fans of the horse and want to see him. So that covers then the Desert Orchid. Chase, so Andrew, back to you, please, for anything else from Kempton. Uh, no, nothing for me. No, Daryl, yourself, please, from Kempton. Yes, I've got two. One one fifty five, Dragonbones, um, 
is going to oh, run it again. Uh, Robert Dunn, the disgraced, <laughs> um, gave this a terrible ride at Kempton behind my sister Sarah. Now, it was never going to beat the winner, but it was just a shocking ride. Um, uh, honestly, I've just completely put a line through that. She's better than that. This is a, a, a weak enough race. I think it's going to cut up quite a bit as well because there's loads of loads of um, double entries, but I think, I think she'll go very well. And then in the 340, there's a horse running called Petit Tonnier. Now, this is a three-year-old from France, um, gone to John Joe O'Neill with, uh, for, for JP. Uh, twice a winner in France, both very easy fashion he did it under hands and heels um now i've been doing my checks this morning because he does qualify for the triumph hurdle um mm. and the boodles could be an option as well going forward but he runs off a handicap mark of 135 but it's, it's not really 135 it's more like 128 because he gets 15 pounds weight for age allowance being a three-year-old so in a month's time he won't obviously get that because he'll he would turn four so this is his last opportunity to run or his first and last opportunity to run really in a handicap getting this sort of weight allowance, £15 weight allowance. Now, the reason I say he's effectively run off mark 128 because if he was in a grade race, he'd only be getting £7. So if he goes and wins this, he shouldn't really be going up in handicap, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, It's very difficult to try, to try and explain. But um, he's really, really interesting. He looks a very nice horse. Now, I think eight of the last nine Triumph Hurdle winners have not been out of the first two over hurdles. So he either needs to be winning this or going very, very close to... To be thought of in that bracket, I've just gone and got an antipost price. Well, I'm, trying, I'm waiting for an antipost price for him um, for the trial, but uh, we'll see. He could turn out to be absolute rubbish, but I thought he was just very, very interesting. Um, they not you, they've not picked up the stick on him in France, so um, it'll, it'll be very, very interesting getting that sort of weight. You know, it's, it's crazy, really. But yeah, I thought it'd be very interesting in three forty. Yeah, yeah. yeah. 340 Petite Tonnerre, that is. And in the Tonnerre. 155, I don't know, uh, there's Dragon Bones then in the 155. So, Daryl, back to you for anything else from Christmas over the Christmas period? No, no, I've just got to try and look one day at a time. One day ahead at a time. <laughs> we'll focus. No, Andrew, yourself, for anything else from over the Christmas period? Yeah, just one quick one. Weatherby 215 on the 27th, the Castleford Chase, Sal, S-A-O, horse I've mentioned previously. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Yeah, run, run about a first time out on considerably quick ground, finishing second. Next time out, he's gone to Donny, raced very freely, finished fourth, but only got beaten three lengths, finishing 14 lengths in front of Daryl's beaten favourite, Stepney Causeway, but we, we don't want to bring that up and embarrass him. Um, but, uh, yeah, so, so if it comes up, if it's proper soft or heavy going, um, yeah, there's a the big race to be won him. He's very, very well handicapped. And, uh, You're going to have to invest in a parachute, mate. You keep jumping off these cliffs. He's got his third start, though. This is his third start season. And to be fair to Andrew, you did say this. Watch him for his third start of the season, though, previously, if yes. I remember rightly. Yeah, so keep, right, keep, keep, clip, clip this up keep and play it back in the fourth. <laughs> keep an eye on Sal if he, if he runs. Yep, Sal or Sayo, again, we still don't really know. Uh, in the 2.15, then, at Weatherby for Andrew. Now, lads, I'm not going to be mean this week and ask you for any sort of naps <laughs> by any means on this show. So we're just going to leave it at that for now, unless you did have anything. But the lads do are going to give their naps so in their columns, which you can find on the website at gg.co.uk, as well as all other selections over the Christmas period, because no doubt there'll be plenty of them. Such is the nature of post-Christmas in the racing calendar. Then from in this country so plenty of selections to look forward to big thank you to the lads for all of their help especially because we haven't had any declarations huge thank you to our sponsors sbk as well we wish you all a merry christmas hopefully you enjoy the action you can sit down watch the racing sit back and relax eat to mince pie and digest all of your christmas dinner and enjoy some quality action so we wish you all a merry christmas and we'll catch up with you again next week 